Uh, welcome everyone uh, to today's seminar. Uh, the speaker is Miguel O'Malley, uh, who is finishing his PhD at Wesleyan University, and um, he will talk about alpha magnitude. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and again, I uh, want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk here. Uh, so this is going to be based on alpha magnitude. This is a paper uh, which is based on joint work between uh, myself, Sarah, who's also here, uh, who you just heard, and Nina Otter. Um, I think this work is really interesting. It relates a lot of different intersectional fields. First of all, magnitude, which I'll introduce here. And this will just be the flow of the talk. First, I'm going to talk about magnitude, which is, I think, a really interesting invariant of uh, metric spaces. And then I'll talk about persistent magnitude, which is a connection between magnitude and persistent homology, which we're probably more familiar with. Then I'll talk about alpha magnitude, which is a specification of that using the alpha complex in particular, and as some new work which we contribute. Then I'll talk about magnitude dimension, which I think is really interesting and perhaps the most powerful connection that magnitude currently has has to another field, which I think has a like really powerful, really compelling result that is highly desirable and something that we would want to leverage, but has a few difficulties, which we think we can overcome with the fifth thing I'll talk about, which is alpha magnitude dimension, using alpha magnitude in order to access that really powerful result. And we have a conjecture as to how we think that's going to work out. So of course, the first thing to talk about, what is magnitude? Well, it's an isometric invariant of metric spaces, which in some sense encodes the effective number of points in a metric space. So if a space has just one point, you would say that space has magnitude one. If a space has n points that are all really, really close together, as if those n points were sort of behaving like they were one point, you would say that space has close to magnitude one. We would expect that space to have magnitude close to one because it effectively has one point. If we have a space with n points that are all really, really scattered, they're all over the place, uh, we would expect that space to have magnitude close to its cardinality. It has effectively n points. It was first introduced in 2011 by Tom Leinster, but the main idea actually appeared beforehand as a measure of biological diversity in a paper by Solo and Pulaski. And it's been shown to encode invariants such as curvature, volume, and dimension. The most compelling of these, I think, is, is specifically dimension. This is a really strong result, and it's the one that we're gonna drill down on more here. So what's the definition of magnitude? If we have X a finite metric space, then we define the magnitude of X to be this sum here. It's the sum over this inverse of a similarity matrix, which is indexed by the values x, y, and x. And then we have the inverse here. So what in particular is the similarity matrix here is a natural question. It's specifically the matrix with values for each x, y pair and x. We take e to the minus distance of x and y in x. So we just take these negative exponentials. And the idea of what these terms are doing is that if e to the minus dxy is close to zero, of course, that means that x and y are pretty far apart. That's a large distance. And if it's close to one, then x and y are quite similar. So it's essentially gauging how similar x and y are, where if it's close to one or one, they're basically the same point. If it's close to zero, they're as different as we can really evaluate. So here's a quick example to get our feet under us with magnitude. If x is a space of two points, of distance L apart, then we can write the similarity matrix of X as this. This is pretty direct. It's precisely what we do in the definition. Then the inverse of this matrix looks like this. And the computation of the magnitude goes like this. So we just take the sum of all those values in the matrix. And then after factoring, we end up with two over one plus E to the minus L. This has a few interesting properties, which actually hold not necessarily in general, but as long as relatively nice spaces are considered, for example, as far as we're concerned, as long as we take points from Euclidean space, these are true. In this matrix, or rather in this uh, function here, two over one plus e to the minus L, as you can see, if L is really small, we're end gonna end up with two over two, or essentially one. So the space would have, in essence, one effective point. If L is really large, then you're gonna end up with two over one plus a really small number. So this is gonna be really close to two, effectively two points. But of course, this is just a number, right? It's, it's sort of telling you like you, you, you put in a space, you get a number. This is not as yet the most informative thing we could have, right? You could think of lots of different ways that you could pull out different spaces that are gonna give you exactly the same magnitude and you'd say, well, it, it, it's unclear to us that this should necessarily be something that is so discerning. So how can we get more information? And the answer is 
we scaled the spaces. So we define this thing called a magnitude function based on a scaling factor T, where what we essentially do is we take the space X and we scale it by T for T in the positive real. So the space either gets very small or very large, depending on our choice of T. And then across all those T's, we can define this partially defined function that takes each of those scaling values T and sends it to the magnitude function. And this is powerfully discerning. Uh, and this has a, a lot of really nice properties. This is where we get uh, all of the different you know, things that magnitude encodes. This is, you know, where the curvature, the volume, the dimension encoding for magnitude come from, this magnitude function. So in particular, for our example of a two-point space of distance L apart earlier, we had that the magnitude of the space is, you know, for the scalar of T, you just put the T in, uh, you end up with two over one plus E to the minus LT. And now, as you can see, again, we're in the situation where if T is chosen to be really, really small, you're going to send this space to essentially have one point. And then if T is really, really large, you're going to scale the space out to have two points. And that's something we can see in this graph here. Um, now, this graph is, is exhibiting some nice properties that we might want to hold in general, but again, hold within relatively unrestrictive but necessary circumstances. So again, in Euclidean space, we're good for these things. As you can see, um, it's a graph. It starts, at, it starts at one. It goes to the cardinality of the space. That's in general true as a, for extremal behavior of magnitude. And then under sufficiently nice circumstances, this will also be an increasing function, which is desirable. So then if we let X be a metric space of three points pairwise distance all apart, just to give us you know, a couple more examples to see what some of these things might look like, then the magnitude function is going to look like this. And again, you can see that property, whereas T gets very small, uh, we're going to have a space that effectively has one point. And as T get very, gets very large, we're going to have a space that has effectively three points. And in fact, for metric spaces of N points, which are distance L apart, we actually, we're going to have that this is the appropriate function to choose from this. This is, this is uh, something that you can get from the similarity matrix without too much difficulty. Um, and in essence, these, these, these nice spaces where we can have this sort of like really nice contained expression for precisely what the magnitude function will be. These are spaces we refer to as homogeneous, um, where you have all the points that are the same distance all apart. If you wanna have like the, the nice picture of this that you draw is this is the uh, endpoint complete graph where you take the shortest path metric. That, that's how this arises. So what about magnitude for compact metric spaces? We've talked about magnitude for finite metric spaces, but of course, naturally you'd ask, well, that's useful, but what about if I take this and I wanna talk about a metric space that has a not finite number of points? Well, it turns out that there is a pretty accessible definition for this, as long as we're in decent enough circumstances. As long as X is a positive definite compact metric space, then we define the magnitude of X to be the supremum over the magnitudes of finite subspaces of X, where we have, of course, the induced metric. Um, then we say a finite metric space X is positive definite when its similarity matrix is positive definite. And in general, we say that a metric space X is positive definite if all of its finite subspaces are positive definite. So then, as a subnote, this is a, it's a result of Mecca's, uh, this is Mark Mecca's a paper that's cited below here, um, but the, this definition of magnitude is uh, in fact, satisfactory in that it matches the other proposed definitions for the same spaces. Uh, that is, there, there are a lot of like, you know, competing definitions of things that would, would be natural extensions of how magnitude is defined for finite spaces that, that you would want to define to take it up to a compact metric space. And in fact, this definition is the same as those other ones, as long as we're talking about positive definite compact metric spaces. If you're not talking about positive definite compact metric spaces, things can get a little hairy. They could potentially say different things. In fact, there are examples where they do so. But uh, this particular uh, restriction to positive definite compact metric spaces resolves that for us. Just a quick example of, you know, so we can see what one of these things would look like, how this happens. If we have an interval in the real line of length L, then the magnitude of that real interval is going to be the length over two plus one. And this is shown in the paper below. So now what about persistent magnitude? Well, this is inspired by actually Nina Otter's definition of blurred magnitude homology. And in fact, uh, Goetz and Hepworth in this paper, Persistent Magnitude, show that by taking the endpoints of the barcodes from the persistent homology of the enriched nerve of metric space X, we can retrieve the magnitude through this alternating sum here. So what's actually happening here is we have, if we have the beginning and endpoints of the barcode, right? Endpoint B, beginning point A and B, put them in this uh, you know, sort of nice form where we uh, subtract them from each other. Uh, and then we take this alternating sum based on the degree of the homology. So of course, it'll be minus one to the zero for H zero, minus one to the one for H one and so on. Um, 
then we end up getting back the magnitude of X if we take this with, in particular, the persistent homology of the enriched nerve. But if we take this over persistent homologies in general, that is, you know, we don't restrict ourselves to the enriched nerve if we get this in just you know, general sense from you know, our usual notions of homology, if we derive this from whatever complex we might be interested in, we just refer to this in general as a persistent magnitude. So here's the definition from uh, Goodson Hepworth, the one that they provide. Um, in particular, they use the, the RIPS complex. They, they end up with a RIPS magnitude. So this is the persistent magnitude of the persistent homology of the RIPS complex, where here we take uh, just, you know, essentially that alternating sum that we had before, but we do it over the barcode that we would retrieve from the RIPS complex. Um, and it's the RIPS magnitude function is, of course, defined in an analogous manner. Right? Like we scale the space by some factor t, and this gives us different RIPS magnitudes in the same way that we get different uh, uh, regular magnitudes for scaling the space by t. Um, and of course, there are some limitations here, right? So one thing that you'll, you'll notice is it seems that there, there's, no, there's no statement here about whether or not we can stop computing the RIPS complex at some point. There's, there's no statement that we don't need these very high degree homologies for the RIPS complex. And that gets troubling if we have spaces of high cardinality because that becomes really, really restrictive as we go down the line. And this is very challenging to use for data sets. And so what we do is we take this definition and we replace the RIPS complex with the alpha complex. And this allows us in spaces of fairly high cardinality, as long as we're in spaces of low dimension, to leverage the alpha complexes restriction on how high that homology is actually going to go. So we define this in an analogous manner. We just use the alpha complex instead. So we also achieve a persistent magnitude. But we think that this is going to be far more computationally accessible and not necessarily less rich. Uh, we think that we also are going to provide a lot of properties, as I'm about to show, that we think really recommend this definition. So again, we define this in the same way. It's just a persistent magnitude of the persistent homology of the alpha complex. And the magnitude function is defined in the same way. That is, we scale it by some factor t. So for finite spaces, just to bring this all together and show exactly like what, what, what is it that we're doing here. For a finite metric space XD with its kth barcode written as such, we write the alpha magnitude of X is written as this double sum where we go over the cardinality of X and then over each hom homological degree where we take the alternating sum of these barcodes. And in some sense, as you can intuit from the sum, it captures the effective number of points in the space. That is for a finite metric space, the limit as t goes to infinity of tx is the cardinality of x. If you wanna see this, just you take all these sums and then what's gonna end up happening is you don't init initially have any of the, the higher homological degrees, but you do have h0, which materializes. So in essence, all of those bars at h0 get arbitrarily long. You have just these points that you have the contribution from those become ones, you have these negative exponentials, those become nil contribution, and you're left with the cardinality of the space as t goes to infinity. On the other hand, as you, you know, fully compress the space to the left, right, you've, you've, you've compressed this barcode. So all you have that really contributes anything of substance is the h0 element that doesn't go away. And this gives you uh, the limit as t approaches zero is one, which is uh, the way you can get these, these nice results for finite metric spaces. And Miguel, a quick question. I was gonna ask what you, what you do with the infinite zero dimensional bar, but there the depth times just yeah. infinity. So e to the yep. negative infinity is, is zero. Is that right? Exactly. Okay, nice. Right. Um, so then just a quick example of this. Uh, something that we're you know, uh, probably all familiar with. We take these three different vertices of an equilateral triangle and we're gonna compute an alpha complex on it. So of course, here we have at epsilon zero, when we have just, uh, you know, just these three points, uh, then we get some nice one simplices at epsilon is equal to one half. And then at epsilon is equal to one over root three. This two simplex shows up and sits on top of them. So here's the corresponding barcode for that. As you can see, we have our H0 elements. These exist until those one simplices show up. And then as soon as we get to one over root three, then that nice H1 element is sat on by the two simplex. So this is just you know, probably a fairly familiar barcode for people. Uh, but then the new thing that we're doing here is the alpha magnitude of X is derived from that barcode. So if we take you know, that of a barcode, we put it into our alternating sum from before, we're gonna end up with this sum here. It's gonna be one plus, you, know, you can check this expression out, but it's essentially just telling you like, you know, put, put, the, put those terms from the barcode in the, in the upper uh, terms here of these negative exponentials. And then the alpha magnitude function is just gonna be this, but we scale it by T. So as you can see, we have one 
uh, plus these terms, and then they're all scaled by t in the negative exponential. And again, if you, you know, want to spend some time, you could stare at this, you could see that what's actually going to happen as t goes to infinity, you'll be left with three. As t goes to zero, you'll be left with one, it's something you can, you can confirm nicely. And it's, it all happens contained in these terms here. So the alpha magnitude of a finite subspace X contained in Rn with two points of distance L is precisely this. This is you know, a fairly quick example. It's something we can say fairly easily. We don't expect anything too complicated to happen here, relatively direct. And similarly, for a finite set of points, this time contained in the real line, I'm not making an assertion about this in Rn, I'm making a statement about this contained in R, uh, where Xi is less than Xj giving us this ordering, we have that we can write this alpha magnitude like so. Um, given that we're contained in the real line, we have this convenience that the alpha complex isn't going to you know, give us anything too inconvenient. It's not going to tell us to do anything with higher uh, degree homologies. We're just going to end up with these H0 elements. It's just, it'll, it'll work out very nicely. It's a very nice sum. Uh, we don't have to worry too much about it. It's easy to compute. But we can further extend this definition to a compact subset, uh, subset of X, uh, compact subset X of Rn by the following limit when it exists over all subsets of X converging to X. So you know you might read that and say this, this, this is a fairly restrictive set of circumstances, and and, and it is. Um, but we it, it we think it's um, relatively necessary. It's a restricted set of circumstances, and for the for the cases we consider, it works out. This this restricted set of circumstances ends up being uh, something we can work within. So we define this in a manner which is basically analogous to the magnitude, a little stronger perhaps. But we require all of these sequences of finite sets x contained in x, which are uh, can, which are converging to x, to you know where they have the same limit. We define that limit to be the alpha magnitude of x. And then by this definition, the alpha magnitude interval, you know, we do this work, uh, we show is one plus B minus A over two. That's just, you know, one plus the, the length of the interval over two in essence. The alpha magnitude of the middle thirds Cantor set is this, uh, you know, relatively uh, complicated looking infinite sum here. Of course, this does in fact converge. It's just not entirely clear what it should converge to, but we know it does. Uh, and the alpha magnitude of the circle S1 is pi plus E to the minus one here. And of course, all of these things can be, you know, relatively, simply give it, it, it turned into an alpha magnitude function by the introduction of T. And in this uh, convergence of the finite subset to X, is that just in the Hausdorff distance? Oh, yes. Uh, fractals are, so yeah, now uh, getting a bit ahead of myself there, but uh, so fractals here, uh, are worth discussing because now, of course, we, we, we want to talk about dimension now. And of course, dimension is perhaps you know, most interesting or most intuitively introduced uh, when you're talking about specifically fractals. And so first, what are those? They're, structural, they're structures containing detail at an arbitrarily small scale, and they're often self-similar. This is you know, sort of a nice reason why we want to have fractals. Probably you know, seen a number of examples of these before. Um, but they're used to model complex physical phenomena, such as snowflakes, fungal growth patterns, coastlines, fluid turbulence and galaxy formulations for you know, nice uh, real world examples. There are also you know, a number of mathematical ones. I'll show one in uh, the next slide. Uh, but it's well known that for example, you know, the dimension of at a point to zero, a line is one, a line is two and so on. But for fractals, of course, the question of you know, what should the dimension of this fractal be? It's, it's a more difficult question. It's not necessarily clear based on these things. because the fractal you know, doesn't, doesn't look a whole lot like a point, doesn't look a whole lot like a line. And it certainly doesn't seem like it has the, the girth of a plane. So we sort of, Ask all those questions. Okay, what, what should the dimension of this actually be? And the, the definitions become more difficult and more varied. So an example, these are the level sets of the middle thirds Cantor set. And this is something which doesn't have dimension zero or dimension one. Here, uh, of course, you know, the construction of the Cantor set is just we keep removing the middle thirds of the unit interval until finally we get to the limit of that, which is sort of notoriously a space which has no interior, uh, but has uh, rather than a measure, uh, but has dimension, which is still not zero. Uh, in fact, the dimension of the middle thirds Cantor set and most dimensions that you take, I think basically all the ones that we would consider is going to be log two over log three. So an introduction of the Minkowski dimension then. Uh, so this is of course, you know, just, a, you know, it's a, it's a little, it's a little much when you initially look at it, but it, it makes some sense. So in essence, we take N X epsilon, the minimum number of closed balls radius epsilon that we need to cover X or equivalently the number minimum number of closed boxes that we need to cover X. Then the upper Minkowski dimension or this box kind of dimension is denoted to be the limb soup as epsilon approaches zero of 
log of that term over log of one over epsilon in the lower Minkowski dimension analogously with a limb if. Then when these two agree, we define the Minkowski dimension of X or the box counting dimension of X to be just the limit as epsilon approaches zero of these two expressions over each other. So some intuition. If we suppose that I contained in the real is a unit interval, then we need precisely one over epsilon boxes of side length epsilon to cover it. And similarly, if we have I cross I and R2, this is just the unit solid now perhaps, uh, then we need one over epsilon two boxes. And similarly for a cube, we need one over epsilon cube boxes and so on. And this gives you the idea of why this, this dimension should perhaps make some sense. Why you know, notionally, it, it seems like this is evaluating the, if you want to think of it, the rate of growth of how this one over epsilon quantification of how many one over epsilon boxes we need to, or epsilon boxes we need to cover the space grows. So we're essentially evaluating in some sense what the space is growing like. So here's a definition due to Mecca's, and it's going to look pretty familiar because it's actually quite analogous. The upper magnitude dimension is defined as instead of taking the limit over the number of boxes, we take the limit as, uh, of the uh, magnitude function as a limb soup. And then below, we take the limit of the magnitude function as a limb inf for the lower magnitude dimension. And this is, this is of course, quite similar. As t goes to infinity, then the alpha magnitude also you know, for uh, compact metric spaces uh, also goes off to infinity. So we have to of course, yeah, consider these sorts of things in definition here, but it turns out this is actually you know, quite nice and it has some nice properties when we define this magnitude dimension. And in fact, there's a really nice result for this. We denote, of course, you know, dim mink the Minkowski dimension just so we have some nice shorthand. Then it turns out that the magnitude dimension of X is the same thing as the Minkowski dimension of X as long as we're in you know, decently nice circumstances where the magnitude for a compact space makes sense to talk about. Um, we can actually say that these two are the same thing. And this is a really strong property because you notice there aren't really too many restrictions here. As long as we have a magnitude dimension, they're the same thing as the Minkowski dimension. Uh, and I mean, this, this is you know, really, really powerful, right? Because magnitude is an entirely different way of considering these spaces that has really very little intuitively, it would seem, to do with Minkowski dimension. So one thing you might want to say is, well, okay, that's really nice, but aspirationally, we might want to use this for example, to approximate the dimensions of spaces instead of you know, doing what we need to do to approximate the Minkowski dimension. But it's really difficult to compute is the issue. Uh, magnitude has this difficulty. So as, as we've introduced it, we need to invert the similarity matrix, but that's done in at least omega n squared log n time. So as the spaces get quite large, magnitude becomes very expensive to compute. It becomes uh, fairly restrictive as we get higher up. Um, but of course, what we think you know, we provide a solution for this is that in alpha magnitude, frequently in lower dimensional data sets, we can perform these computations much faster. And so we can perform, if we can have an analogous definition to magnitude dimension, we can have these dimensional estimates in a far shorter period of time computationally. So we want to consider, of course, you know, okay, that's, that's nice, but can we decide, is there, is there a good reason to think that alpha magnitude can provide us with a similar dimension property? Is there, is there a reason to think that we could get an analogous result? And so we provide this definition. We define uh, the alpha magnitude dimension for XD to be the non-negative real number. Uh, the alpha magnitude dimension of X is defined to be this limit as T goes to infinity, where essentially we define the same thing, never uh, limit exists. Um, one question you might ask is here, it seems like we forego the definition of, of of an upper and a lower alpha magnitude dimension in a manner analogous to the magnitude dimension. This is a choice that we made because we didn't come across any circumstances where the upper and the lower alpha magnitude dimension disagreed. It might make sense to do something like that in the future if someone comes upon an example where they exist and disagree, but we haven't done so. And in fact, in, in the examples uh, considered in the persistent magnitude paper that we consider where the upper and lower uh, Rips magnitude disagree, which has a, an, an, an analogous presented definition. We found that the alpha magnitude actually doesn't disagree and resolves that difficulty. So we didn't uh, see a good reason to provide that distinction so long as there wasn't a distinction it seemed to make. Uh, so here's a few examples. The alpha magnitude dimension of any finite set contained in the reals is zero. This makes sense. The top is going to, it, the top is strictly limited by the cardinality of the space, right? We can't get any larger than that. And the bottom is going off to infinity. So this is an immediate result. 
for the unit interval, we have that that top expression has one plus t over two. So it's not so hard to show that the limit of this expression goes to one. Um, this is just log of one plus t over two over log t. This is also relatively immediate. And then this is a result that we show, uh, but the alpha magnitude dimension of the middle thirds Cantor set is log two over log three. And this is of course desirable because you'd really like this to be the case. The, the, the Cantor set, uh, you, you'd consider it pretty important. To, if, you, if you have any measure of dimension, you'd, you'd first want it to be like, okay, well, surely it must agree with the Minkowski dimension of the Cantor set. And in fact, it does. Uh, we confirm this, this is a true fact. Um, and then for estimating the alpha magnitude dimension, Right. What we would want to then do is given a metric space X, right? So now because of alpha magnitude's computational efficiency, one of the things you might want to do with it is say, okay, so is there some way that we could sample points from these spaces that we want to know things about the dimension of? And could we somehow use that to figure out what we think the alpha magnitude dimension should be? Is there a nice efficient way for us to do this? And in fact, so we want to estimate this limit here. The way that we do this is by studying sequences of finite metric spaces, which we sample from these spaces. Uh, and then we want to essentially you know, estimate this double limit here, right? But the method through which we perform this is by taking n sufficiently large so that this quantity here, the difference between that cardinality n uh, for that space that, that samples alpha magnitude and one fewer point uh, sampled alpha of magnitude uh, is small enough so that we can essentially consider that, okay, so by adding more points here, it doesn't seem like we're getting any more alpha magnitude. We are not becoming any more enriched by adding more points to the space. So we could consider that TXN is more or less representative of TX alpha. And we consider this to be, you know, we, 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 we put in this fairly restrictive limit that we demand that these be, uh, that, that, that the gain for adding one more point to be no greater than one times 10 to the minus five power. Um, and you know, this, this is a, we, for our uh, estimates, for our estimates, we we think that this is you know it ends up being fairly excessively excessively restrictive, but it's also fine. We think that you know having more points is certainly acceptable because alpha magnitude affords us so much computational efficiency that it's actually not particularly onerous to put in more points, uh, which is sort of the whole benefit of this exercise. So here's one of our figures, one of our estimations, um, and it shows I think just how good the correlation from alpha magnitude can be. This is um, really visually, I think, sort of pleasing. Uh, the idea is that, so to describe the, the, the premise of these plots, right? What we're essentially doing is we're plotting the log of one over the log of the other. And if this exhibits a portion of the graph, which is linear, then we can essentially consider this to be through a sort of, you know, version of L'Hopital's rule, an evaluation of essentially how the top is growing against the bottom. And this, this gives us some evaluation of what we think the dimension should be doing. And this is for the Cantor set. Now, we also actually computed the alpha magnitude dimension of the Cantor set, but we also estimated here to confirm our methods. And here we get an estimation of 0 0.6309. For those of you who recognize log two over log three, this is really, really close. Um, so this, this is a very good estimate, both visually and numerically. Um, and we think that this is you know, sort of encouraging that we have the same result for the Cantor set. Uh, similarly, we also provide the alpha magnitude of a circle. Uh, and we also then, you know, this allows us to compute the alpha magnitude dimension of a circle. And we also get an estimate of you know, 0.996, which is very, very close to one. So we think that this is also a very strong estimate for the alpha magnitude dimension of a circle. But then, of course, you know, these are you know, fairly simple examples. We should work something that's a bit more unknown, a bit more exciting, something that we actually think you know, is, is, a, is a reasonable contribution to using these methods of dimension estimation in a way that you know, it would be attractive to use magnitude, but computational efficiency becomes restrictive for. So the Feigenbaum attractor is a subset of the real interval generated by this recursive function, which you'll recognize as a logistic function, uh, when A, this factor there, is equal to 3.5699. In particular, this is actually frequently referred to as the, the onset of chaos. This is a you know, common term if you see this in uh, perhaps statistical uh, textbooks, for example, I think is, is one of the places where you'd run into this sort of language, um, where in essence, it's the point where the logistic function sort of splits off in this graph and sort of infinitely splits until it on the right, as you can see, it certainly seems to have dimension as we described before, this, this massive splitting property. Um, and in particular, this onset at the Feigenbaum attractor, that, that particular vertical slice, 
it has really interesting dimension. In fact, we can't actually compute the Hausdorff dimension of that set. It's 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 we like you actually you can't compute the Hausdorff dimension of it. So the the state of the art in computing the Hausdorff dimension of Feigenbaum attractor is through estimation, and it's been estimated to be approximately. 0.538 or so. That's that's the that's the state of the art in approximating the Hausdorff dimension of the Feigenbaum attractor. Um, our estimate here, using our methods from earlier, is about 0.497, which is pretty good. Of course, you know it's a little more. You know it, it seems to be a little more visually off than our other estimates, but we think you know with the Feigenbaum attractor, we expect perhaps a little more chaotic behavior. It's not necessarily too surprising that this might be a bit more off, and we're certainly we, we don't seem to be off in left field with this estimate, so we think it's somewhat encouraging. Um, and a, a provision of something which is, it's also close to other estimates of the Feigenbaum attractor's dimension, which exists through other measures of dimension. We think that this is fairly amongst the pack in terms of uh, how good of an estimation we think it is. So the previous examples, the ones that we just went through, lead us to state the following conjecture, right? So for X subset of Rn compact, when the alpha magnitude dimension exists, then we think that the alpha magnitude dimension should be the Minkowski dimension of X. Uh, of course, this is, you know, fairly restrictive. This is only when we know that the alpha magnitude dimension exists. So not only does the alpha magnitude have to exist, but we require the alpha magnitude dimension to exist. But we think that under these circumstances, we should retrieve the Minkowski dimension of X because of our uh, previous examples or computations. We think that this is fairly uh, convincing in terms of you know, the, the heuristic approximations. So some conclusions. Alpha magnitude is a new invariant for finite metric spaces, and it has many of the same attributes that magnitude possesses at greatly reduced computational cost. So this is something we think is ra rather you know, heartening. We can do a lot of the same things that magnitude does in terms of it evaluating the effective number of points in the space. It thinks that clustered point spaces are you know, smaller. It thinks that less clustered spaces are larger, et cetera. Um, we, provide com uh, we provide computation of alpha magnitude for foundational sets. So. These are some of the ones we considered, finite subsets, intervals of R, as well as for a set with fractal properties, the Cantor set in particular, and we conjecture connection with Minkowski dimension. Finally, we propose that alpha magnitude represents a computationally efficient method of estimating dimension for data sets of interest. So in particular, we think that this alpha magnitude dimension uh, notion is really encouraging. We think that you know, it really warrants uh, further study. Like what, what is it that we can do with this? How can we achieve things with this? Uh, what computational methods can we use and what systems can we put this into to acquire you know, new and interesting results for dimension that we think will allow us to uh, access more estimations of dimension that we were otherwise limited to? And perhaps can we actually you know, demonstrate this conjecture? Can we show that this is going to give us information that's as rich as the magnitude dimension through alpha magnitude, a far more you know, computationally efficient method? OK. Uh, and so with that, I will uh, finish up and ask you know, if anyone has any questions. OK, so thank you, Miguel. Uh, so before we get to questions, I would ask everyone to unmute themselves and to give a round of applause for the speaker. Mm, yeah, and uh, very good. So yeah, so now it's time for questions. I'll start with the question. So Miguel, I was wondering if you could go to that um, slide where you were explaining um, taking the limit in T and the limit in N. This is regarded re related to how you set up your computational experiments. Yeah, sure. so actually, um, go. sorry, go forward. Oh. Um, okay, uh, let, me, let me see if I can. There, this yeah, right here, right here. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I was confused by the, um, the last line where you say for T equals one. So, mm -hmm. Um, um, I mean, for each choice of t, you'd like it to be, you'd like n to be sufficiently large so that one more point doesn't change this estimate too much. But you're saying right. that, um, so what do you mean by for t equals one here? Uh, so this is just the point at which we computed it. Um, it doesn't seem to get too out of control as our t grows, um, regardless of whether we did this at t equals one or t equals like relatively large powers. This was you know, sort of uh, computationally confirmed. We could have also included this restriction over a broader band, but it didn't seem to be too necessary as long as we made this uh, initial bound really, really restrictive. Um, so we ended up taking it, I think, like this is essentially to provide us a guideline to tell us like, you know, okay, like, does it make sense to take a million points here or four million points here? Um, in essence, we found that this gave us really quite, you know, 
at, the, at, the, at this level of uh, cardinality taken, the, 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 this gave us fairly high fidelity results. Um, so it didn't, it, it didn't seem uh, necessary to provide a wider framework of T's over which to take it. But you, you sort of uh, look at T equals one and you look at um, this, you know, 10 to the negative fifth to, to yeah. find what N should be, whether it should be 1 million or 4 million. Yeah. And then once you've done that, you vary T, you know, from zero to one and maybe a little bit larger. Uh, yeah, so it, it, we vary T uh, as T essentially you know, runs off to uh, larger terms. Um, gotcha. And then, yeah, it's, it's, we, we then perform the estimation. Uh, as we described, but again, this is this is just essentially to provide us with you know sort of sort of a guidelines so that we weren't sort of just kind of wibbly wobbly asserting like this is enough points, um, and you know essentially presenting uh, our results as sort of an approximation in that sense. Um, yeah, and we th we thought that this was yeah in, in enough of a guideline to ensure that okay we we're we're taking enough points here we're not taking enough points here we should take more points here etc. And then if you go to um, advance maybe one slide or two where you estimate the sure. um, right here, perfect, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, so this uh, tailing off where the blue curve moves away from the purple curve in the upper right, that's sort of saying now N is no longer large enough compared to T, is that right? Uh, yeah, so what's happening at those upper points in the curve is, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's precisely what's happening there, right, yes. Um, so yeah. It, but what's happening over there is since these are finite spaces, of course, like, you know, as, as we had our earlier result, like the, the alpha magnitude dimension of a finite space is zero. So what's eventually going to happen with all of these things is it'll get up to this point. And then at this point, like the, the quantity that we have on the, on the left there is finite. The quantity that we have on the bottom there goes off to infinity. So at that point, it's no longer representative. Yeah. And then at the bottom left, however, I mean, the estimate of what you're trying to compute in, in blue mm -hmm. is perfect. It's just that the limit hasn't sort of converged yet yeah. to the dimension. Okay, very nice, cool, thank you. I appreciate that. Other questions from Miguel? I'll ask another question. So um, this is a really cool way to, to estimate, you know, the alpha magnitude dimension and by proxy, potentially things like the Minkowski dimension and, and so. Do you know what, um, roughly speaking, what are various techniques that folks use to try to estimate fract fractal dimensions like the Minkowski dimension or the Hausdorff dimension, things like this? Do, do you know what, uh, mm -hmm. what other, roughly speaking, what other like ways there are to do this? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, there, there, there are a number of me like, you know, methods and computations. Like, you know, for example, I think some of the earliest attempts to compute the Hausdorff dimension or any other dimensions of the, for example, the Feigenbaum attractor date back to um, these 83, 84 papers by Grossberger, um, for example. And that uses things like information dimension, correlation dimension, different measures of dimension, which are, you know, blend themselves a little better to being estimated than, you know, taking boxes and perhaps counting them or the Hausdorff dimension, which is computationally, you know, it's, it's you, you look at the definition of Hausdorff dimension and it's like, well, uh, how am I going to tell a computer to do this? Uh, it's sort of, you know, measures of dimension, which we think look like the Hausdorff dimension, but estimate them better. And estimating these methods is also uh, a fruitful way of doing this. I know there are also uh, methods of performing these estimations with uh, persistent homology, for example, as well. Um, which, yeah, I mean, surely, uh, yeah, uh, which are also very you know, fruitful methods. Um, so, for example, uh, right, but we, we think alpha magnitude is is is, a, is another direction to you know take these estimations, which is uh, sort of yeah you know, we we think the sort of the, sort of the extra benefit that we bring here on top of you know, estimating the persistent homology is that we specifically uh, bring this connection to magnitude dimension to the table. So I think that the, the advantage that we have here perhaps is that um, we think that in future, it could be a fruitful direction if we can demonstrate that the alpha magnitude dimension has connection to the magnitude dimension, because then we would have a firm result. And then we would not you know, think that necessarily we, we're estimating something that looks a bit like dimension. We're actually, this, this is an estimation, if we can show this, of the box counting dimension. Um, and then the, the, the method has some more force that way. Very nice, thanks. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. 
more questions. Okay, so I think if there are no further questions, I'm gonna thank Miguel again, and then um, stop the recording. And if you are shy, you can ask questions afterwards. So thanks again, Miguel. Mm -hmm.